Um, yeah, I'm Kevin Baker. I'm a clinical psychologist from Knox Healthcare, so quite a long way away. Um, and I'm seconded to do the teaching on this course, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Well, I used to be a psychology lecturer as well, so teaching is sort of quite natural, normal for me. Okay. So, um, briefly at first, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the programme that we're going to be talking about, which is an IAPS programme that we run within the Faculty of Health. So IAP stands for Improving Access to Psychological Therapies, and it's a national programme um, that is run in a number of universities across the country to deliver psychosocial interventions for people, with, um, for people who are experiencing mild to moderate anxiety and depression. So it's run, it runs across England and it offers psychological interventions which are based on NICE guidelines. So it's a very prescribed course um, which is based on the evidence base of NICE guidelines for people with anxiety and depression. And this, this improving access to psychological therapies in primary care offers a number of different courses for people with mild to severe mental health problems. But the one that we run at John Moores is for people with mild to moderate mental health problems. So the students that we, we, we have at John Moores are trained to be psychological wellbeing practitioners, PWPs for short. And this role, it's a year-long course at John Moores. They're, they're with us um, at university one day per week, and they're in practice, they're employed within practice four days per week to start to work as psychological wellbeing practitioners. And I said it's to work with people with mild to moderate mental health problems. We offer the course um, at undergraduate level, level six, and also a postgraduate level seven um, certificate level um, program that we offer. And people come onto the course, it's taught together, but people come onto the course and they're assessed whichever level that they're on the program. So the program started at John Moores in 2008. We were successful in Manchester and you plan to deliver PWP training in the Northwest. And we've run the course twice per year since 2008. Then in 2011, the, um, the SHA um, in the North West agreed nationally to support um, or to fund training to deliver the same programme for individuals who are deaf. And that, that, the tender went out in 2011 and again, and we were successful to deliver that programme. So that programme is the same programme, same one-year programme, undergraduate or postgraduate level, same curriculum, but that it's taught within BSL for individuals who are deaf to support people with mild to moderate mental health problems who are deaf. So that started in 2012 and the first cohort that we have um, started in January and that's the cohort that Kevin's going to talk to you about as we go on today. When we originally um, applied for the tender and from a number of different levels at John Moores but also at the SHA it was thought about that we would just deliver exactly the same programme, um, same structure, but just that we would teach the programme and we would have interpreters at the side of us teaching the students. And naively, on a number of different levels, we thought that's what we would just do and it would work fine and the delivery was quite the same, would be the same. The more that we then started to look into it, we, the more we all looked at that that wouldn't be an effective programme and it wouldn't have worked on a number of different levels. So we, we then started to make a number of different adaptions. So we made adaptions to the curriculum. So because the people were travelling from across all over the country, um, we had to change the structure that people can't be travelling on one, one day per week. But also that we had to look at the structure and the teaching sessions, the content and how they would be delivered. We looked at that it wouldn't have been effective or as effective for us to be teaching it with an interpreter. So to look for um, somebody who's able to teach the sessions, which Kevin is, who's also fluent in BSL, who then would be able to deliver the programme. Uh, none of the materials were in BSL, so we had to look at adapting the materials, the national materials and our, all our own our local materials, the assessment guidelines and different things had to be looked at and the assessment structure overall, how we, how we undertook the assessments, how we delivered exams, also had to be revised. So from thinking it would be quite straightforward, there was lots of changes to the programme that happened. So from, an, from a, a programme level, we had to make changes. From a JMU level, I think it was something that, again, as, 
as a faculty and as a university, we needed to look at how we, how we were going to deliver this program and make sure that it, um, it was a successful program and the environment that we delivered the program in, which is the Thai Barn Street building, was an effective building. So there was, there was knowledge and awareness that we needed as, as lecturers about working with students who, who are deaf and also about the support that we can offer and identifying people within the faculty who also were fluent in BSL to be able to support students coming into the university. And linking in with services um, and the disability services and linking in with the support that they offer. So it's been a learning curve for us at JMU to make sure that we were delivering this programme effectively. And then also for the professional body, again, the pro professional body, um, which is the BPS, the British Psychological Society, I think also thought that we would just deliver this same programme, um, again, just using interpreters, and it would flow the same way. So we've had to have a lot of communication with those to make sure that these trainees will still come out as accredited practitioners and can still practice um, and be registered with the professional body. So that, again, has taken a lot of... Um, emails, meetings, um, to be able to ensure that we've made some adaptions and it, make, it, it flows well. So it has, I think now we're getting it right, um, but I think what we started with at the beginning is a very different programme to actually how now it started to flow through. So Kevin's just going to go through the programme with you. In the, okay. Yeah, thanks Lisa. Um, I don't know where to start really, because there was so much that we needed to change. Um, I must admit, the first when kind of asked me to do the teaching, I said no, because <laughs> there's actually so much to change, so it's been a, quite a, a long process, as Lisa's explained. Um, I, I mean, in a way, it, it, it's obvious, but only in hindsight, because the reason we're using um, a new way of teaching sort of uh, people to do PWB training, because they're deaf and they use BSL, it, is the same reason that we need to adapt stuff in the university. You can't just go to a psychologist with an interpreter, it just doesn't work. You can't just go to a counsellor with an interpreter for a deaf person, it just doesn't work. Because there's lots of cultural aspects that are different, and that's the same for the teaching situation as well. So who are we teaching? Well, we've got seven um, severely to profoundly deaf um, students. One of them is somebody who's lost his hearing, so he has fluent speech and fluent English, which um, Boats him quite well because obviously he can write and read fairly well. But the other students have quite a low level of literacy, and that's normal for deaf people. Um, they're all pre -ling most of them are prelingually deaf, so they're born deaf um, before they learn language. One of them is postlingually hearing loss, like I said, so he's a little bit different. Um, they have, most of them have some kind of spoken language, but I would say 90% of them, you know, about six of them, don't use speech at all. You know, they'll, they'll sign their voices off. Um, like I said, they've got a reading age around about 9 to 11, which is an average reading age for a deaf person leaving school at 18 in this country. Um, a few of them have worked really hard on their literacy because they're quite committed students. They've obviously been through quite a lot of um, experiences that have been quite difficult for them and they've, they've striven quite hard to get to where they are at the moment, actually. So they're, they're not normal students. Um, you know, they work really hard. Um, but really, the best way to think of them is people with English as a second language, even the guy who has hearing loss, you know, he's lost his hearing, he has fluent spoken English, he still gets tripped up by idioms and metaphors and things like that, because he just doesn't hear them in everyday conversation. Um, so we have normal deaf gaps in knowledge, so what, what a deaf gap is, is the, just a common um, occurrence of communication every day that they kind of miss out on, you know, conversations in the background, in the corridors, the radio, in the car. That never happens, so they miss out on a lot of kind of knowledge, um, and that's normal. So we have to work differently towards a student if they have a, a gap in their knowledge. Um, I expect all of them have about average to high intelligence. As a psychologist, I'm obviously interested in that. I expect actually that there's little, they have a little bit more skill than a normal average deaf person, otherwise they wouldn't be here. Um, they're all fluent in British Sign Language. Um, we did have somebody who was, who was fluent in Irish Sign Language. She came on the course, but she had to leave for different reasons. Um, like I said, they've all got very good coping strategies, and actually they're role models to other deaf people, which I think is, is a bit of a bonus for them being a PWP. They're used to revising, they're used to reviewing course materials, and they do it daily and weekly, not like the hearing students I used to teach when I was at university. Um, so they're, they're actually quite different animals from normal students. And that makes it easy for us, in a way, as long as we can do the BSL. So how do we know what to do with a deaf student when you've got one? Well, usually, 
the things happen quite differently to what we're doing, and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, deaf education, or education for deaf people, is usually based on these kind of things. The Warnock Report in 1978, which is really about inclusive education, but it's about mainstreaming, about putting people into mainstream situations to include them in mainstream society. It's not very good, it doesn't really work. Warnock doesn't like it anymore. Um, the education acts are based on that, and educational policies in the 90s was based on the idea of inclusion. We can look at those policies and try and work out what to do with a deaf student, and I'll explain what happens in a minute. There's also stuff in higher education, not very much of it. There's some kind of stuff, um, there's some local areas of expertise of working with deaf students in some universities, but not very often, and they don't really publish very much. I don't know whether they want to keep all that information to themselves to make them special, but there's some useful information from the Open University called Here to Help, which is about how to adapt your course to a hearing, uh, sorry, to a, a deaf student on a hearing course. It's not really useful for us, but it's useful for other places. And the advice or the intention for all this context of teaching in deaf higher education is to provide sign language interpreter, have loop systems in a room so they can switch their hearing aids on and hear something, which is not very good if, hearing, if they don't use hearing aids. Um, and maybe to have communication support workers who would help um, translate the communication into a simpler level of English or sign language, um, take notes or somebody on a palantypist, one of those sort of stenographer machines, um, to write something up in, in, in visual English rather than acoustic English, and then having vibrating alarms. So all of these issues we've had to deal with in the course and the university, but, but a lot more because we're doing it differently. We're not included, we're not having a deaf student in with a group of hearing students, which is really what this is all about. Um, um, and all these um, sort of mainstream inclusion kind of courses, they have to adapt their written assignments as well, which um, does make it quite difficult when you've got one student in a cohort of hearing students doing something differently. It's actually easier for us. We know from the research in deaf education that learning style is influenced by teaching style and learning style is influenced by the course context and the pre-existing beliefs of a student. That's the same for any student, you know, hearing or deaf, doesn't matter. That's what the research says. We know there are two types of learning, um, at least. One we could call meaning or reconstructive oriented learning, where we want the student to actually reconstruct the meaning that we're trying to give to them. Okay, and that's linked to a deep approach. It's about getting the students to relate ideas to each other, using evidence, try and get a comprehensive understanding of uh, an area um, they may not know everything, but they might at least know how to get to know everything. And that's what we're trying to teach, obviously, at degree level, isn't it? Um, and we're trying to encourage active questioning of the lecturer, of the seminar groups, etc. We're trying to get them to relate one module or one topic in a module to other modules and other topics. And we're trying to get them to relate evidence to conclusions and to think divergently. And I think that's the aim of higher education and degree systems. Um, but conversely, we have reproductive-oriented learning where we take a surface approach, we're kind of bound to a syllabus, as we are on our IACT programme. Um, I've forgotten what improvidence means, so I'll leave that aside. Um, but that tends to engender a fear of failure in the students because they know they have a set criteria of facts that they have to learn. They try, and in this situation, we encourage students to memorise stuff and I'm defining the task that I want them to do. There's reliance on the detail that they have to cover. And that usually engenders anxiety about their own academic performance and also my anxiety about my students' academic performance. And you can see from both of those approaches, they're both valuable. They both have places, but we may um, want to put more emphasis on the meaning or reconstructive oriented learning at the end of a degree course, definitely in the third year. Um, now, for the postgraduate certificate that we're after, I think we're, we're looking for the same kind of thing, but because we're within the confines of a program of practical applied work, being a psychological well-being practitioner, there's a lot of this to go through first. So I'm not, not promoting one above the other, but I'm saying that they're both important, and perhaps the meaning 
reconstructed oriented learning is the one that we really want to end up with at the end of the course. But what does this tell us about deaf people? You know, does this apply to deaf people and their experiences? Because, of course, it's, um, as we said before, it's the pre-existing beliefs of the student that makes teaching and learning easier for a course and for a tutor, etc. Um, this is all available to hearing students. You know, an 18, 19, 20, mid-20s or 30-year-old hearing student can easily access this theory of information. Deaf people don't. So there's a hypothesis there that deaf students will come with pre-existing expectation that will be different from a hearing student because their experience of deaf education is quite different. And indeed it is, actually. In mainstream settings, you usually get one or two deaf students in a cohort of hearing students. So they're the minority, and they're different. Um, and an interpreter is there to help them access information. And that's the intention of the inclusive education um, sort of plan that Warnock encouraged. And we know from the research that that situation encourages a reproductive learning style. Um, because there's a preference when you have an interpreter in the room that everything is focused on the teacher through the interpreter. We know that interpreters in higher education um, have a style of interpreting that encourages rote learning. It doesn't encourage deep learning because there's no opportunity to question the interpreter or the lecturer. Because, and I'll explain why in a minute, there's a little bit of a delay between the speech and the explanation or the metaphor used by the lecturer and the interpretation given by the sign language interpreter. We know that contacts can encourage neutral reproductive style of interpreting, and that's quite common in um, an interpreting situation. Sign language interpreters tend to come to universities, and they've also got a reproductive style of learning in their heads. That's what they think the lecturer situation is about. So they don't actually interrupt the lecturer situation, saying, oh, hang on, my deaf student didn't understand that. Can we have a discussion about that? That doesn't happen because we've also got the interpreter now in the situation of learning. However, the sign language interpreter training doesn't promote that idea in interpreters. We know that from research in the UK and in America, that interpreter training can influence the context of learning in universities. So here's a typical interpreter situation. So we've got a lecturer there and an interpreter doing his job. And the lecturer is probably thinking, I know this topic really well, that's why I'm teaching it. But I don't know a thing about deaf students or BSL. No need to worry, because we've got the interpreter. So already the, the lecturer is distancing him or herself from the deaf student. Um, oh, let me start a few slides. OK, never mind, we'll go here. So here's a situation again. Class of hearing students, the lecturer talking away. Sign language interpreter, a deaf signing student in the corner, separated off. And as they talk, the sign language interpreter is hearing things at the same time as the hearing students, but the interpretation comes a little bit later, so there's a delay. Okay, oh, here we go, back again. But the sign language interpreter is probably thinking, I don't understand this topic at all. I'm an interpreter. I'm not a psychologist or a nurse or an OT or whatever. Um, but I try my best in BSL, and I hope the deaf students ask questioning. So already the interpreter is pulling themselves out of the responsibility of learning in the situation. And then the deaf, deaf student's probably thinking, I don't understand that interpreter. What's he going on about blaming the interpreter? Or, or probably as well as, I don't understand that lecturer. What's he going on about? Well, this is all too complicated for me. I bet all the hearing students understand this, which is a similar thought or expectation that they probably had from school and at home in their family. Most fam deaf families of deaf children are hearing. Um, so they get used to that expectation. So the difficulties with this approach, this inclusive approach to higher education, is that the deaf student is really reliant on the quality of interpretation, and their ex the experience delay in interpretation reduces their engagement with the topic provided through the lecture or the seminar, and also the lecturer feels disengaged with the students because of different language and different expectations happening there. Um, it's difficult for the student, the deaf student, to engage with any group task, with any discussion, and also with incidental learning, you know, reviewing their 
um, their homework or their, their assignment topic in the ca cafe bar. You know, it doesn't really happen with a deaf student. They're left on their own with their interpreter all the time. And so I would say, arguably, it's absolutely impossible to be fully inclusive. And in fact, the inclusive approach could do some harm. Um, so what are we doing on this course? Well, Lisa's has given you a good idea. So it's not just an academic course, it's a practical and applied course. We're trying to teach people who don't have any experience of counselling or a very reduced experience of counselling some basic counselling skills which we build up on a kind of way that I act want PWPs to be trained. There's some theory in there, there's some history, there's some research evidence that we need to talk about. There's the NHS context and psychological therapies context we need to teach them because they don't really know very much about that either. Um, but there's also opportunities for them to personally reflect on their own responses to the situation, to the course, to the future career and personal development going on. So you can't, you have to have both aspects of you know, a meaning oriented uh, approach to learning and a kind of a rote learning approach. You need both. And so we've got a bit of a problem if the inclusive approach just tends to promote reproductive learning. So how are we doing it? Well, we're teaching all the seminars and all the discussions, all the lectures in BSL, with me doing um, all of that. We have used interpreters, um, but students hated it. They really didn't get on well with it because they had that disconnection with the lecture and they couldn't ask questions. Um, However, there's me um, doing everything in BSL. Um, we did think about note-taking and having a note-taker, and a couple of students wanted that because that was their expectation from mainstream inclusive courses. They'd have somebody else sitting down writing. And we kind of ummed and about that for a few weeks at the beginning of the course. And I, I said, well, I don't really think you need it because everything here is BSL, we discuss it. But note-taking is different when you're deaf, because if you're signing in BSL, you can't look down and write, because you'll miss everything that's going on. So we have to pace the lectures in a different way. So we have like 10 minutes discussion, lecturing, me dribbling on about something, and then five minute break for them to write down. But I know that all of them go home at night, and they spend an hour or two writing everything up. They try and look back through the day, um, and I think that, that's really noticeable with these students. Um, but also, to help this, I have an end-of-session summary discussion which records on video, which Neil organises for me, which is fantastic. So at the end of a, um, a teaching session, it could be just a morning or an afternoon, um, I'll sit down with one of the students with a camera on us, and then we'll do, I'll discuss what we've just taught. So with me guiding that discussion and the rest of the class watching us, that's a form of note-taking for them. But also, that encourages discussion, it encourages reviewing the whole topic that we've learned, not missing anything out, and it's there permanently for them to look at. Um, so that, that's good. That's something that we, we kind of had to produce because we're working in sign language, visual language, and we can't take notes at the same time. But I don't see why that has to be a deaf thing. That could be for any, any group of students. And it's quite a good way to reviewing a subject. I used to do it in some other courses, but I didn't really video it. I didn't need to. The students would be there writing their notes. Um, so that's something quite different. All of our practical sessions, the role plays that we do, the counselling sessions that we practice are recorded, and I put them on Blackboard with the students' permission so that they can review them and then take notes at a later time. Because <coughs> usually at an end of a session, we're all quite tired, um, so it's best to have a bit of a gap and then they can review things, and the only way they can re review them is obviously on video. And the students are involved in discussions with each other because they're a group of BSL using students. And we have some of the assessments in BSL, not all of them because you are expecting them at the end of their training to be professionals um, in the NHS, and they will have to write reports and letters. So encouraging them to use their English <coughs> is quite good, and it shows them that we're quite serious about what they need to do. But there's also going to be some things that are actually quite wrong with this kind of a cr approach of um, doing everything in, in a deaf, culturally acceptable and BSL way. Um, and that's that we're a little bit isolated from mainstream ideas. So we miss out from the other hearing cohorts that are obviously developing their way of working. And I think that's a bit dangerous because one, you know, the reason that Warnock did her report and we have social inclusive um, policies and education <coughs> policies is because we don't want deaf people to be ghettoised and separate, and we know that that's bad. And that, we, we've got a danger of that happening on the course, actually. 
So we have a segregated group. When it's down to the individual deaf students' characters, whether they integrate um, you know, with the um, people in the university, their, their sort of students on, on the other courses, it's down to them, actually. I'm not really, have a, I don't really have anything to do with that. But maybe that should be a normal expectation. But there is a danger of them being segregated. Like I say, there's no inclusion with mainstream hearing peers, and that's a bad thing. So I'm encouraging them to make links locally with their IAT services and the NHS, and, and two or three are doing it. And when they do, you see a huge difference, because they're learning from a different way of doing psychological well-being practitioner work that I can't provide, because I'm concentrating on deafness and mental health. So I'm encouraging that to mitigate this problem. Um, and there's some references for the stuff that we've talked about.